Good evening and welcome out to our Wednesday night uh, service here, live stream service here at Calvary Baptist Church. This has always been a very special night uh, for us here at the church. It's the Wednesday before Easter and we've always come together to take time uh, to look back at that old rugged cross, to take a moment to look back at the price that Christ paid and we always have the Lord's Supper on this particular night. Unfortunately this year uh, we're not able to do that. We're not able to, to be together in the house of God and uh, partake of the Lord's Supper like we have. But I believe tonight can be a very, very, very special service. <clears throat> I don't think God is bound by our tradition. And I know, I know for a fact the Word of God is not bound. And so tonight, I'm going to ask that those of you that are joining uh, by live stream, Wherever you're at, may this be a time and a place of reverence tonight. May it be a point of reflection tonight uh, where we're going to look back on that old rugged cross and look back at some things that took place at that time. And so we're going to make this very special. Even though we can't be together here, we can be together with the Lord in spirit uh, because we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so tonight, uh, I want you just to take a time and reflect. I want it to be a serious, not a somber time. Because we know there was victory on the cross. But a very serious time where we look back at Christ and those things that he did. So we're going to join in prayer. We're going to get our hearts and our minds ready for worship tonight. And then we're going to turn it over to the boys and let them sing a little bit. And then we're going to get into the book of Hosea. That may sound like a very strange place tonight uh, to look back at the cross from. Uh, but uh, I'm going to give you Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 if you'll go ahead and find that. I believe this will be a great place uh, to take a moment to look back at the old rugged cross. So if you'll find Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, and we're going to go ahead and open in prayer at this time. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be here and to be in this live stream service tonight. And Father, it breaks my heart, Lord, to not be able to be with my brothers, my sisters, my church family tonight. Uh, to worship and, Lord, to be together under one roof and partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance uh, of, the, of your broken body and in remembrance of your shed blood, uh, Father. But at the same time, I believe together as we join in prayer right now around our iPads or, or around our tablets or around our phones or computers, that, Lord God, we can be in one mind, in one faith, in one spirit, looking back to one Savior that died on the cross at Calvary over 2,000 years ago. And Father, I pray, God, that tonight would be a time of reflection and remembrance and that, Lord God, you would make the cross real. You would make that environment around the cross real, that we would be able to hear the sounds. We would be able to see tonight through the eye of faith the things that took place over 2,000 years ago, that, Lord God, you would open all of our senses tonight Lord God, that we may be able to take in and drink in the fullness of that event as much as we can in our mortal bodies. Tonight, God, may this be a very special time. Uh, Lord, even though we're not together under one roof, Lord God, I pray that in every home, that every individual be touched in a very special way. And maybe somebody is logging on tonight, that Lord God has never truly been saved. They do not have that peace in their heart of knowing where they would spend eternity. Father, I pray, God, tonight that as they look back at the cross, they would realize there was a fountain opened there, that shed blood, Lord God, that can cleanse and wash away all sin. Father, I pray, God, for your blessings, Lord, on this service tonight. Bless our hearts, but help us to be a blessing as we remember you. And we pray for your touch upon the singing and the preaching, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. His disciples of things to come. He would be persecuted, being and mocked. The Son of Man would die on the cross, but He didn't stay dead, and He won't stay gone. 
beginning in verse 1 tonight. And the Bible says this, Come, and let us return unto the Lord. For He hath torn, and He will heal us. He hath smitten, and He will bind us up. After two days will He revive us. In the third day He will raise us up. And we shall live in His sight. I want to look at two phrases that I want to piece together. One in verse 1 and one in verse 2. That is going to give you the title of my message tonight. In verse 1 it says, He hath torn. And then in verse 2 it says, In the third day He will raise us up. I want to preach tonight for a few moments looking back at the cross on some things that were tore up before He came up. Some things that were tore up before He came up. Let's pray. Father, bless the message tonight. Keep Satan from hindering Your Word as it goes out. And I pray, God, that as You promised in Your Word, it would not return void, that it would be used tonight to touch the hearts of those, Lord God, that are listening or that will listen in the days to come. And I pray, God, tonight that as we look back at the old rugged cross, again, make it real to us. Help me to preach this with power and wisdom. And God, give us understanding and open hearts tonight. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, by way of introduction, I'm going to look at a couple of things that I want you to see out of verses 1 and 2 in Hosea chapter 6. And number one, I want you to notice in these two verses that we find a future prophecy. A future prophecy. In verse 1, it says this. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn, and He will heal us. He hath smitten, and He will bind us up. We're looking there at a future prophecy uh, of the rejection of the nation of Israel. Now, we know that they rejected Christ over 2,000 years ago, and they're in a process of being torn and smitten by God. We can go back in time and we can see where Titus was part of God's plan to tear them and to smite them. Hitler was part of God's plan to tear and smite the Jews. And then finally, in the tribulation period, the Antichrist will also tear and smite the Jews as well before they come back to the Lord. So we see a rejection of Israel in this future prophecy. But then in verse 2, we see a restoration of Israel also in this future prophecy. In verse 2 it says, after two days, underline that, will He revive us in the third day He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. So we see here a restoration of Israel. Now using the formula found in 2 Peter chapter two or chapter 3 verse 8 where it says this, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. We find that in that two days in verse 2, after two days, that is the 2,000 years of the church age. 
the 2,000 years of the church age. So notice this restoration is going to take place after those two days or those 2,000 years. But then we find in the third day, that would be that third 1,000 year time frame after the 2,000 year church period where we find the millennial reign of Christ and in that the Lord Jesus Christ will restore Israel and they will live in His sight as He rules and reigns from Jerusalem. So we see a future prophecy, but now we're going to bring it where we're at tonight and we're going to see a fulfilled prophecy tonight. Look out in verse 1. And I want you to notice it says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn, and He will heal us. He hath smitten, and He will bind us up. That is a, a fulfilled prophecy of the vicarious atonement of Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ was torn by God the Father and smitten by God the Father for your sins and for my sins. Amen. We find the vicarious atonement there in verse 1 where Jesus Christ was torn. It talks about how that it pleased the Father to bruise Him. And so we find there that there was a vicarious atonement. In other words, He stood in your place and my place so that we would not have to suffer being torn and smitten by God. I sure am glad tonight on this Wednesday night before Easter, when we look back at the old rugged cross, we look at Jesus Christ who was hanging there in your place and mine, smitten for you and torn for you. But we also find a fulfilled prophecy of the victorious resurrection. Look down in verse 2, it says, And after two days will He revive us. In the third day He will raise us up. Now, it was that passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 and 4, whenever he said, and he arose on the third day according to the Scripture. This was what Paul was talking about according to the Scripture. There's no other place in the Old Testament where, the, where, where uh, it speaks of anybody raising up on the third day. It is right here. This is the only place. So Paul was looking at Hosea 6 and 2 when he referred to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the third day. Now, I said all that to say this. In the verse, we find it referred to as us. So how does that refer to Christ when it says us? I'll tell you how. In Colossians 2 and 9, it says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hey, I can tell you this. It was not just a man that was laying in that tomb that day. It was 100% God and 100% man that was in that tomb whenever He was raised up. So there was a us that was there in that tomb. And I sure am glad that He came out of the grave after three days. He wow. rose again after three days. He was revived after three days. He lived again after three days. I'm glad tonight we don't serve a dead Savior, but we serve a living Savior who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. Right. Now, I said all that to say this. I want to look at one phrase in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1 as we look back at the cross tonight. It says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn. He hath torn. I mean, when I read that, it, it creates an environment for me spiritually that is terrible and horrible and awful. And the only way I can get myself out of that is to look in verse 2 where it says, In the third day He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. When I look back at the cross tonight, I want to look at a few things that had to be tore up before He came up. Some things that had to be tore up before He came up. Number one, when we look back at the cross, we find some clothing that had to be tore up. Some clothing that had to be tore up. When we look at that, we see that at the time of the crucifixion of Christ, we can see the clothing of a sinner that was torn. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 63, the high priest rent his clothes. In other words, it was like the high priest was standing there at the time that Christ was being tried right before the crucifixion. And if you could picture the incredible Hulk grabbing the clothes that he has and ripping them off of himself, that is exactly what the high priest 
did there. There was sinners' clothes that were being torn. What tore him up so bad that he had to rip his clothes there at the time that Christ was being tried? I'll tell you what it was. Number one, his religion tore him up. His religion, it says he was the high priest. Let me tell you what his problem was. His religion stood between him and redemption. That's right. His religion stood between him and redemption. You've got to understand that on this Wednesday night, there is a multitude of people around this country that have religion, but that religion is keeping them from redemption. Right. They would rather hang on to some tradition that's been handed down to them through a denomination or through a preacher or a priest or whatever their mama and daddy's told them instead of actually looking Looking at what the Bible says they need to do to be saved. And their religion will take them straight to hell one day to burn for all of eternity. This man was tore up by his religion. If I could give you advice tonight that would help you more than anything, it would be to put your religion down and pick up the Redeemer and look unto Him and be saved. Don't you count on your denomination or your baptism or your religion to get you to heaven because you cannot get there by religion you can only get there by redemption. Right. It was his religion that tore him up. But then number two, it was his rejection that tore him up. He ripped his clothes as a sign that he would not receive Christ. He said, this man blasphemed. In other words, he rejected the Lord Jesus Christ right there before his face. Do you realize tonight that if you're lost and without Christ, that if you've never truly been born again and washed in the blood of the Lamb, listen, you say no to Jesus tonight. You're doing the same thing this man did and you're rejecting Him to His very face tonight. That's right. I find the sinner's clothes that were tore up. Number two, I find the Savior's clothes when I look back at the cross were tore up. The Savior's clothes were tore up. In John 19, verses 23 through 24, they had stripped Jesus down completely naked. They had nailed Him to the old rugged cross. They stood Him up in open shame as, as was the tradition of that day uh, amongst the Roman Empire when they crucified somebody. And there He was now, uh, crucified in open shame without a stitch of clothing on. His clothing now is down around the old rugged cross and He is there uh, on the cross and, and around there the centurion and soldiers that were guarding him were at the foot of the cross and they began to pick up his clothing and rip it in half, tear it in half and began to divide it up amongst themselves. And whenever I look at that, I find that in that day Christ wore three articles of clothing that they were going to try to tear up. Number one was his girdle. His girdle that was wrapped around him that he would tie off. And that was a traditional Jewish garment that he would have had to have worn in that day. That girdle speaks of the sacredness of his office. Do you realize that a priest, a prophet, and a king all wore a girdle at that time? And so whenever he wore that girdle, it spoke of the three offices that he had, of prophet, of priest, and of king. But when they ripped up that girdle, let me tell you what they were saying. They were saying, Jesus, we're rejecting your priesthood, we're rejecting you as a prophet, and we're going to reject you as a king as well. So they ripped up the girdle. Number two, he had on an outer garment. That spoke of the salvation of souls. It was that outer garment that the woman with the issue of blood, when he walked by, touched the hem of the garment, and through that she was made whole. Listen, that spoke of the salvation of souls. They ripped that up as well. And they said this when they ripped it, hey, I don't want anything to do with your salvation. I'm perfectly fine with my pagan gods, and I do not want you. But then there came a third piece. Oh, this third piece was the coat that was woven from the top to the bottom and was without seam. This third piece spoke of something very important. But let me just say this before I tell you what it was. There was something about this third piece that was so supernatural that when that centurion picked that third piece up that was woven from the top to the bottom that he tried to tear it, but something said no. He could not tear it in half. You say, what was that preacher? Why, it was the scriptures that said it could not be torn. In Exodus 28 and 32, they could not tear that garment because it was the garment of the high priest that symbolized his sinlessness when he went into the Holy of Holies. And if it was torn, then his sinlessness would have went away. Hey, but I'm here to tell you tonight that they might have rejected and torn up the sacredness of his office. And they might have rejected and tore up the salvation of souls and wanted no part of that. But there was one thing they could not tear up. One thing that people 
people have been trying to tear up for over 2,000 years. And that is the sinlessness of the Son of the living God. Hey, you can tear a lot up in Christianity, but there's one thing you cannot tear up, and that is the Lamb who is without spot or blemish. There is no way that you can tear down the sinlessness of Christ. For 2,000 years, they've been trying over and over to find fault in Him, but time and time again, they've had to say what Pilate said, I find no fault in Him. They have to say what Judas said, hey, I have betrayed the innocent blood. They could not tear that down. Not the devil himself could not tear that down. No scholar can tear that down. Today, he's still the sinless son of God. Right now. I find some clothing that was tore up. A sinner's clothing was tore up. A savior's clothing was tore up. But I want to talk to you for just a minute about the saved whose clothing was tore up. You know, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, it says this, and listen carefully, rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, if you're going to be saved, it cannot be some outward display of religion where you tear your garments and you act like you're tore up over whatever you are. Do you realize that is nothing more than outward religion, but inward regeneration is a breaking of your own heart? Yep. Listen, if you're going to get saved at all, it is not external, but it is internal. For the Bible says He begins a work in you which is well-pleasing in His sight. Do you realize tonight that a person who gets truly saved, it is never external. As a matter of fact, some people externally, you can't even tell they're saved because of the way they they look, but if you break your heart over who you are, and that's a sinner, over what you are, and that is full of the devil, and over where you're going, and that is a place called hell, and over who you've hurt, and that is the God of this universe, yeah. if you'll break your heart over that, then that is an open door that God himself can walk in, and he says, I stand and knock, and if any man will open the door, I will come in to him, and I will suck, and I will be with him. Hey, I sure am glad tonight that God is looking for broken hearts all over this county right. and all over this country who He can walk into and He can save them from their sin. Man. There was some clothing that was tore up. When I look back at the cross, I see a second thing that was tore up and I find that Christ was also tore up. I find that Christ was tore up. The Bible says in Mark chapter 15 verse 15 that Pilate had him scourged. I don't know if you can truly grasp. I know I can't. I've seen paintings of it. I have studied the history of it. I have seen the instruments that were used for it. And I still cannot wrap my mind around it. I cannot quite grasp how terrible a thing it was when Christ was scourged. It says in the works of Josephus that, and in also the works of um, of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, it says there that many times these Roman soldiers, when they would whip these people before they crucified them or before they executed them, that they would oftentimes literally remove the skin and the flesh from their body on their backs, their legs, their buttocks, so much that you could literally see the bones and the tendons and the vessels. And they specialized in taking people to the point of death without actually killing them. And they said that many times this would be such an incredible and a terrible event that people would literally go mad from the pain and lose their minds before they were ever actually taken and crucified or killed. I find that the Bible speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 11 when it talks about the Lord's Supper, the instructions given to Paul Jesus told Paul whenever he laid all of that out, he said, this is my body which was broken for you. It, it, it says that it didn't say bones. The bones were not broken. It was his flesh that was broken. Yep. And then it talks about in Hebrews 10 and 20 how the veil of his flesh was rent. It was torn. I look back at the cross and I see Christ was tore up before he came up. Whenever I look at what tore him up, there's three things I notice. Number one, I find the cure for sin with the tearing of the whip. 
The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and 24, by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. I don't know about you tonight, but I, I picture in my mind as they tied him up to the whipping post, stretched his arms out, his feet were barely touching the ground, and they began to lay that cat of nine tails into his flesh, and they would rip and pull that the Bible says there was a fountain that was open for sin, for the cleansing of the house of David, and that fountain was none other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Can't you see it just running out of him? And that those stripes that were there let that blood out that the Bible says this about. It is by his blood that we're cleansed. It is the blood that washes away our sins. Yep. Hey, I'm glad tonight there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Right. I thank God tonight that when we look at the cure for sin, we see it comes from the tearing of the whip. Number two, I see the curse of sin which comes from the tearing of the crown of thorns. Whenever you look at what they did, they took that thorn, those thorns that were there, two inches long, poisonous tips, they fashioned that, they put it on his precious head, and they beat it into his skull with a, a reed that was there, and they beat it, and they beat it, and can you now see the blood that was running down his head? Those thorns, when you go back to Genesis 3 and 18, you'll find this out, that they represent the curse of sin. Aren't you glad tonight that we can have the curse of sin lifted from our souls through Jesus Christ? Right. Number three, I find the conquering of sin with the tearing of the cross. We take him up to the cross now. He's had the crown of thorns on. He's had his back torn up. And now they lay him on that old rugged cross. And they begin to put those nails and tear his flesh in his wrist and in his feet. And they hang him up on that cross. And what I see when I see that is the conquering of sin. Because the Bible says in Colossians 2 and 14, it says, took it out of the way. Talking about our sin through the nailing it to his cross. Hey, I'm glad tonight that he took every dirty, rotten, foul, filthy, wicked thought I've ever had, word I've ever spoken, everything I've ever done, both inside and out, and I thank God he nailed it to the cross at Calvary, yeah. never to be remembered anymore. Aren't you glad tonight that we've got a Savior that was tore up? Yes, amen. amen. I find clothing that was tore up. When I look back at the cross, I find Christ was tore up. I find also, when I look back at the cross, a curtain that was tore up. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. In other words, if you had ever seen this veil, which by the way, they have made it all over again. It is there at the Temple Institute. It is a long, tall, thick veil that no man can actually tear in half himself. But secondly, and he especially could not reach to the top of it because it was so high. If you notice in the scriptures, it was torn from the top to the bottom. What that tells me is this was an act of God Almighty. There was a curtain that was tore up there that day. Why is that? I'll tell you why. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and you'll find that when Adam and Eve sinned and God kicked them out of the garden, He put a do not enter sign up. He put a keep out sign. That garden was the place He communed with them and He walked with them and He talked with them and He had fellowship with them, but He hung a keep out sign up. And for 4,000 years, that keep out sign was there. And the closest you could get to God was was to get close to the high priest who went in one time a year to offer the sacrifice. But that was as close as you could get. And many times, if he went in unworthy, he was killed and would not come back out alive. But I sure am glad. Yeah. I thank God tonight cool. that there was a day when Christ died on the cross at Calvary. That God took that and he tore that curtain in half. Yeah. And instead of saying, do not enter or stay out or keep out, it said, all are welcome. Yeah. I'm glad tonight that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Amen. Right. I find a curtain that was tore up. This affected three things. Number one, it affected our relationship with God. In other words, now man can have a personal relationship with God. He don't have to go to Jerusalem and go through a temple which ain't even there no more. But he can have a personal relationship with God right now, right here, 
wherever you're at. Yep. James 4 and 8 says, draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. If you can picture there, the veil of the temple is rent and God is there and you take a step and God does not sit on the mercy seat and wait on you to get there. Oh, listen, you take a step towards God and God will stand up and begin to take a step towards you. Right. I'm glad tonight that I've got a God that wants to be close to you and He says if you'll draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to you. Number two, it affected the relaying to God. It says now in Hebrews 4 and 16, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. I'm glad we don't have to go through a prophet or a priest or a pope to get our prayers answered, but we can go straight to the throne of God in the name of Jesus Christ and you can pray right where you're at tonight and have your needs met. You don't have to be in the house of God or at the altar of God, but thank God you can get right where God's at tonight if you come in Jesus' name. Number three, it affected the rejoicing of our God, over our God as well. We can worship Him. Do you realize that back in that day, to worship Him, you had to be where the temple was at or where the tabernacle was at? Hey, but I sure am glad when He ripped that curtain in half. I thank God that wherever you're at, whether you're at home or whether you're in the house of God, you can worship Him and you can worship the true and living God in spirit and in truth. Hey, listen, live stream is no substitute for being in the house of God right. when God commands you to be there. But I sure am glad that we don't have to be here when the doors are shut down to worship Him. Right. But around your desktop, around your laptop, around your iPad, around your phone, you can clear yourself a spell, a place out, and have yourself a spell tonight and worship Him because where two or three are gathered, He says, I'll be in the midst. Amen. Right. Yes. There was a curtain that was tore up. And then lastly tonight, I find looking back at the cross, not only was there clothing that was tore up, and Christ was tore up, and a curtain was tore up, but creation was tore up as well. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 51, the earth did quake and the rocks rent. In other words, the rocks were torn in half. Do you realize that all over Jerusalem, and we've been over there where this took place, I've stood in the very place where this took place, that all over Jerusalem there are huge boulders, limestone rocks and precipices that are literally split in half. And that can be dated back to the time of Christ. And whenever I read that and I see that, I see that creation was tore up. It speaks of three things. Number one, it speaks of the power of God. Only the power of God can do that. Yep. Only the power of God could supernaturally time that earthquake with the very moment that Jesus said, it is finished. And he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's when the earthquake took place. And that was God's time. It speaks of the power of God. I believe this though. I, here's what I think. I think that when Jesus said it is finished, and this is just my thoughts in my mind and in my heart, I believe the earth shook because in the heart of the earth is a place called hell. And I believe that whenever Jesus said it is finished, that it literally shook the gates of hell. It shook the very gates of hell as a sign that the devil's days are numbered. He tried everything he could to get him to come down off that cross or keep him from going up on it. But he failed. And when Jesus said, it is finished, the Bible says he defeated him who had the power over, the, over death, that is the devil. I sure am glad tonight for the power of God. Number two, it speaks of the promise of God. Because in Matthew 27, 52, it says that whenever that earthquake took place, that many of the graves of the saints which slept opened and the bodies of those saints arose after His resurrection. Do you realize that over there, every one of those tombs, every one of those graveyards over there, those tombs were made out of limestone. And whenever this earthquake took place, the rocks basically tore in half. Many, it didn't say all, but many of these tombs of the patriarchs that were over in that land that had been dead and gone and buried for years also broke open. And then after three days when he came up, they came out. 
And they began to go into the city of Jerusalem. And I believe they were the first soul winning team. And I believe they began to knock on doors and they began to say something like this. He is risen. 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 And I believe that's the same message we need to preach today. That there was a cross that He died on. But thank God there's an empty tomb that He came out of. And He is risen. It speaks also, lastly, and I want to take you over to the book of Revelation of the punishment of God. Go over to Revelation chapter 6. I want to show you something here real quick in closing. Revelation chapter 6. Because there's another earthquake that's coming. And it's going to be after the church is raptured up off of this earth and after we're gone. Revelation chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 12. And the Bible says this, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, the Bible says that the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now those stars are not talking about the gas bodies, but those things that would appear as stars up in heaven, like asteroids and comets are going to be crashing into the earth. Even as a fig casteth, uh, fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll... When it is rolled together, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. I brought that up to some of my friends in St. Vincent uh, on the island when I was preaching there. And I've been there four times and, and was preaching with them and brought that up. But one day, the islands on which we've been preaching uh, in Puerto Rico and St. Vincent and other places are going to be gone one day. They're not going to exist anymore. And the Bible says in verse 15, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us. In other words, this earthquake is tearing these mountains, these rocks apart, and they're going into and hiding in the rocks. Notice in verse 15 at the end it says, In the rocks. They're hiding in those broken open places. And it says, fall on us, in verse 16, and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Do you realize that there's coming a day where this world is going to be tore up, this creation is going to be tore up again? But if you're here for that, it's going to be too late. Because you would have passed up your opportunity to get saved and said, I would rather do it my way. And you're left behind. The church is gone. And here you are. And you'll be stuck in the tribulation. And the Bible says you'll be sent a strong delusion and believe a lie and be damned. Because you believe not the truth and righteousness. I am sure glad tonight when we look back at the cross, we see some things that were tore up before He came up. But here's the good news. He came up. Right. I sure am glad tonight that even though all of these things were tore up, there was clothing that was tore up, Christ was tore up, a curtain was tore up, creation was tore up. But thank God on the third day, He came up. And He is alive. And He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And He's there making intercession for us. As we close out tonight, as CJ begins to play softly tonight, I want to just take a moment to address anybody that may be listening or that may listen that if you... Wherever you're at, around your phone, your iPad, your computer, whatever it may be, listening in this live stream tonight. If you are not 100% sure that you're saved, if there's doubt in your mind, you don't have peace over where your soul is going to spend eternity, maybe you may have even made a profession at some point, but you just can't say for sure, preacher, if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. And if you don't know for sure, the Bible says these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm sure I'm glad the Bible makes salvation very easy. If you know that you're a sinner, and we all are, and you know you need to be saved, and we all do, and you know there's only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ and His shed blood, and that is the only way. For He said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know all of those things. There's only one thing keeping you from getting into heaven. And that is this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Maybe right where you're at, you would like to take a moment and bow your head in the best way you know how. Maybe from the bottom of your heart as a sinner coming to Jesus to save them, you would like to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. But Jesus, I know you died for my sin. I know you shed your blood for me. And I know you arose on the, again on the third day. And I know you can save me right now. So Jesus, I'm going to ask you to save my soul from hell. To forgive me of my sins. And to be the Lord of my life. Jesus, thank you for saving me. I'm glad to report that if you meant that from the bottom of your heart, the Bible says if any man will come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You put your full faith and trust in Christ. On this Wednesday night, thank God, you can say with full assurance you are saved. Maybe right where you're at, though, you are saved, but there's some things that are just not right between you and the Lord. And you look back at what He did for us on Calvary and all these things that were there. And you'd like to take a moment right where you're at to bow your head and just say, Lord, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to get rid of these things that are in my life. I got some bitterness. I got some anger. I got some sin that's there. Some secret things that I should not have in my life. And, and Lord, I want to get rid of that tonight. And I want to give that over to you. My heart tonight is tore up. And Lord, I'm asking for you to fix it. And maybe you'd like to just pray for a few moments while CJ plays before we close our service now. services since we started the lockdown. All of them have received their new convert materials and I would like to be able to extend the same to you. So if anybody accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, please let me know. Message us on Facebook on our page and let us know so that we can rejoice with you and we can get these materials to you. And also I wanted to say this, anybody that's wanting to send their tithe in or uh, that's wanting to uh, send an offering in or anything, again, this is I, I've set up a completely different mailbox, so I do not have my hands on it. I don't know who's given what, and I don't want to know who's given what. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So if you want to send a tithe or an offering in, uh, you can send it to Calvary Baptist Church, Post Office Box 180, Duffield, Virginia, 24244. Again, that's Calvary Baptist Church, Post Office Box 180, Duffield, Virginia, 24244. And uh, you send that in. Our treasurer will pick that up and put it in the account. And uh, we would much appreciate whatever the Lord lays on your heart to give. Also, continue to check out our devotions on our both our church Facebook page uh, and also our youth Facebook page. If you would check those out, we're running devotions every day. We've got some very exciting things for you this week, especially with it being the Holy Week and leading up to Easter Sunday. And so if you'll check those out. And also, uh, we want to encourage you to join us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be having our Easter drive-in parking lot service. Uh, we've got our security team that's going to park you where you're facing the red top from wherever you're at. And that way you can view the service. And we're going to be uh, not only live streaming the service, which don't use that as a reason to stay at home. We want you to come on out. Uh, but we're also going to be broadcasting the service through WSWV. 1570 AM and also 101.9 FM right directly into your car so that you can hear that in real time through your stereo system and be a part of the service at 10 AM. This will be kicking off our services that will be parking lot services, drive-in services at 10 AM from Easter Sunday on until this lockdown is lifted up. 
and uh, we're, we're excited to be able to minister to you in that fashion. I'm also looking at ways to be able to get sealed um, uh, little packets of the Lord's Supper with the uh, juice, the uh, unleavened bread and all that that we can put in your hands, let you open it yourself so there's no contamination or anything like that. And we can observe the Lord's Supper during one of our parking lot services. I am uh, very excited about that. I've just got to nail down a few things with it. And then we're going to hopefully be able to announce that soon as well. And also continue to join us at 6 p.m. for our live stream services um, on Sunday night. Uh, this coming Sunday night, uh, I won't be preaching. Uh, but we're going to be uh, streaming our Easter drama that was from last year. Uh, and we're going to be putting that on the um, uh, website. So you can click on that, invite people to watch it. There will be a very special invitation given at the end of that service. And so if you want to join us at 6 o'clock on Sunday evening to watch that, uh, it was such a blessing last year. Saw a ton of folks saved and looking forward to God using that again. And so if you would just remember all of these things. We appreciate everybody working so hard. Appreciate um, Dale Barry, uh, also uh, Robbie Wright working to try to get us where we can get the uh, uh, radio station up and running and uh, be able to have these services. We're so thankful uh, that everybody's pitching in to try to make this the best experience we possibly can. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close out in, in a prayer. Do I have anything I'm missing announcement-wise? You mentioned Tabitha? Uh, yes, Tabitha Collins finished reading through the New Testament, correct? Uh, finished reading through the New Testament. She was the first of our youth to, to finish the New Testament. Got a very special prize coming for her. And uh, looking forward to getting that in the hands of the other youth. Let that be motivation for you. And uh, we appreciate her and appreciate everybody reading through their New Testament. And continue that challenge. You've got nothing else better to do. You don't have school or anything else. There's no excuse for you. All right? And so uh, please continue to read that book. It's a great book we got. Thank God for the services we had tonight. And look forward to worshiping with you in the parking lot or by live stream on Easter Sunday morning. So let's close out in prayer together. Father, thank you, Lord, for the chance to be able to open this book once again and to be able to just take a moment to let you speak to our hearts through the power of the scriptures tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for letting us look back at Calvary and see all those things that were tore up before you came up. But I'm sure glad that as much as was tore up, that, Lord, when you came out of the grave, that, Lord, you had that glorified body that will never be harmed or hurt again. And you have resurrection power. And you said in your word that all power was given unto you, both in heaven and in earth. Thank you that you have the power to save tonight, the power to soothe, the power to supply every need we've got. And I know you've got the power over the sickness that's sweeping over our country. I won't pray in arrogance tonight, demanding that you do anything. But I pray for mercy tonight, asking, Lord, that in mercy you would get rid of this mess so that we could come back together and worship you in spirit and truth in the house of God. Lord, I love you and I thank you and I thank you for your blood. And we ask it in Jesus' name.